lot to talk about, so we'll we'll jump into it right now. Um, we're going to deal with just you know as much as we can here in the next 45, 50 minutes. Uh, some ideas to keep you playing healthy. Uh, I assume that most of us in here are pianists. Craig, I'll put this back here just in case anyone uh, comes in. Um, uh, I'll, there's a big thing that we're hearing more and more and more about, and, it, and it's been more common for the last 20 or 30 years, and that is musicians' wellness. Um, and we hear, you know, about pianists that are injured from playing or maybe hear about violinists that are, you know, injured in playing. And for a long time, folks really didn't talk about these kind of things. They've always been there. But uh, for a long time, folks really didn't talk about it because, you know, I, I don't know why. There's probably a lot of different reasons. You know, if you're a, uh, a, a violinist or a pianist or someone with a major symphony orchestra and you let it out that you're injured, you know, I guess folks are afraid of losing their position because, you know, you need folks that are going to be there to play. Maybe the same thing if you're a college faculty. Or, who knows why, but, uh, the, you know, injuries among musicians are kind of a dirty little secret that have kind of always been around, but no one's really, really talked about it. Has anyone in here, and I'm not going to put you on the spot and make you tell me your story, but has anyone in here dealt with any kind of playing-related injuries that one, you know, that you've and the rest of you haven't. And if you haven't, you're you're really really lucky in that. I don't know if anyone was in the. I, I know you, you guys were. I don't know if anyone was in the session uh, that Joe and um, Nan and uh, Ken Meadema Ramble um, was there. And, uh, it was kind of a, a. I forget what the name of it was, but it was a roundtable, you know, breakout discussion. And I actually was not on the panel, but I spoke up a little bit and shared a little bit of my my history. Uh, I I. In my early 20s, came down with a severe right hand injury. Um, I was going to school in Georgia, Georgia State, and working on my master's. And I, you know, like anyone that goes through music school, was practicing as much as I could, you know, usually six or seven hours a day, every day. I, my family would make fun of me. I'm ashamed to admit it, I would even practice on Christmas. I would always sit there on Christmas Day and, and, and go through some Chopin etudes for a little bit. And um, I was getting ready for a contest, which happens not too far away in Shreveport, Louisiana. It's called the uh, Wyden Piano Contest. And I, I don't know. Something just happened right there in the center of my wrist. And um, to be honest, it, it was severe enough that even to this day, I still play well, but I don't play like I played when I was in my early 20s. I, I think that that level of playing is probably... Um, you know, closed off from me, unfortunately. Uh, and and, and a, a large part of it is just because I didn't really know how to get help, you know, for it. And so the best that I could do was just kind of sit there and suffer through it and try to play through it. And, um, you know, I went to all the doctors and they did all the obligatory tests. It wasn't carpal tunnel. Some of you might be thinking, oh, you had one carpal tunnel. Uh, they really didn't know what it was. Uh, and I, I kind of, in some ways, kind of have my own idea on what it was. I think there were some spiritual things that I was going through that I, I shared uh, in this roundtable. But it, it got to the point where um, I, I really could not, at its worst, I really could not play the piano more than two or three minutes a day. And, and it was that kind of needle-sharp, excruciating pain. That, that I had. And, you know, I had a teacher in my master's degree there that was a very understanding guy, and he let me take the weeks off that I needed, and I still finished up, got my master's. The amazing thing is, is I put together a program and went to the University of Colorado and auditioned and got into their graduate school as a uh, doctorate student. And I didn't tell my teacher that I wanted to audition for a wonderful guy named Andrew Cooperstock. He's still at the University of Colorado. And I didn't tell him that I was injured when I auditioned because I thought it might cause me to not be accepted into the program. So I suffered through an hour-long audition and played it, and played it very well, and got accepted. And then, you know, summer goes on by, and then fall happens, and I move to Boulder, and I'm sitting there, and in our very first lesson, I say, oh, by the way, I'm injured. I can only play a little bit at a time. 
But he was absolutely fantastic, and, and there were some folks in Boulder that really understood ergonomically. That's kind of a buzzword now. Um, but, you know, everyone's trying to be ergonomic and how they type and, you know, and how they blink and how they eat. I mean, everyone's just ergonomic. Well, there, there were some great teachers there that really understood how you play in a tense, tension-free manner. And, and the truth of the matter is, I, I had fantastic teachers. Uh, I, I was with a wonderful teacher um, through my uh, undergrad and my master's, and I, he was absolutely fantastic. And so I, I don't know really what caused my injury. I don't know if there was a little tension creeping into my playing that I missed and my teacher missed, or I wonder sometimes, like I said, just for a whole another discussion, if it was just kind of a God thing that, you know, um, that kind of he used to change the course of my life just a little bit. Well, quite a bit, not a little bit. But I, I learned an awful lot uh, in the years trying to, figure out what in the world was wrong with my hand, which dominated really most of my 20s, I learned an awful lot about how you play the piano and avoid injury. And, uh, and so that's the big, long, you know, sob story, but that's, that's kind of the setup here. And a lot of this stuff is, I, you know, I, I hope when I tell you some of this information, you don't think, God, I missed out on another session to come to this. I, I mean, a lot of it is pretty common sense stuff. Uh, but it's things that as pianists we don't usually always think about until it's too late, you know, and we're hurting or we're a little bit sore. And, you know, what's the old saying? An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, the first thing that uh, I want to talk about is this idea of piano-related injuries are not a new thing. And I, I have a little book here, that I, a little paper that I put together when I was going through doctorate school. Uh, as I was rebounding from this. And so I'm going to read a couple of quotes from it. Uh, I dislike when I'm teaching reading out of a book because, you know, when you do that, you don't make an eye contact. It's easy to kind of lose me in people's own out. But if you'll let me kind of read some of these quotes, it, it kind of sheds some light on, on piano-related problems. We probably have all heard of Leon Fleischer, right? Leon Fleischer, of course, was uh, a major concert pianist who, um, I believe in the 60s, maybe the 70s, but I think in the 1960s, came down with uh, a, a hand issue. And only just in recent years has he regained the use of both hands. And, and even that is a compromised reuse of both hands. I, you know, he's never going to play. And I, I, I'm assuming Leon Fleischer is still alive. I believe he is. Uh, but he must be in his 80s now, and so, you know, he's spent the, most of his career really unable to, unable to do it. To do it, yeah. And so he taught it, and he played, I believe it was right hand that was hurt, and so he played left hand literature. Another guy that uh, never, uh, who had a hand injury, and he really just stopped trying to recover the use of his hand, was Gary Grafman, uh, mm -hmm. if you've ever heard the name Gary Grafman. Um, Gary Grafman, gosh, with Leonard Bernstein, he uh, performed and recorded my favorite version of the Rachmaninoff Second Piano Concerto. Uh, if you've never heard that particular version, you need to go to iTunes and look up Gary Grafman Rock Two, and the recording he did with uh, Leonard Bernstein conducting is just you know, 25 minutes in paradise. Uh, it's a lot of phenomenal talent. Anyway, but it goes back farther than that. Okay, so here's a quote. We've all heard of Clara Schumann, Robert's mm -hmm. wife. Okay. Well, Clara Schumann, if you know anything about her, you know that she uh, was not actually only Robert Schumann's wife. She was a wonderful composer herself, and she gave up composing after Robert passed away because she felt like it was her life's duty to promote his music. And, and that's wonderful that she did that. That probably contributes to all the Robert Schumann music that we know. But there are probably some wonderful Clara Schumann pieces that you know never uh, really made it to the light of day because she selflessly, self is selflessly, excuse me, selflessly decided to uh, promote her late husband's music. Well, she was also a phenomenal concert pianist. Apparently, when you read you know uh, all the literature, she was right up there you know on virtuoso level with Franz Liszt. So she says this in one of her letters: Throughout my entire stay in Copenhagen. I always had to tolerate grief and anxiety concerning my fingers, which were constantly inflamed from much playing. Uh, Paderewski, you've probably heard of the great virtuoso Paderewski, he says, 
I had become used to the constant and terrifying pain in my arm, and I had also learned to play with four fingers only of my right hand, so I don't, well, maybe it was his thumb that was not working for him, and to adjust my will and nerves to the ordeal. I felt, as did the physicians, that I might never play again. And then one composer that's not too far removed from us is Rachmaninoff, and we of course know uh, that Rachmaninoff was a superior pianist. And even Rachmaninoff, right, he, he writes in a letter to someone, I'm very tired and my hands hurt. Every extra hand movement tires me. My concert season has ended, and it is as if my hands have lost feeling. The more I get tired, the more pain I have. This means that by the end of the concert season, the pain is almost constant. And then finally, more recent to us in history is the Canadian pianist, Glenn Gould, which we all, all know Glenn Gould. And uh, in his diaries, here's what he writes. He talks about, quote, a very disturbing breakdown of control over my hands, as well as lack of coordination. You know, so uh, they, these things, these injuries are, are you know, they're, they're kind of around more than, than what people would realize, and they really affect everyone. You know, even, even the professional players that we think might not, um, might not come down with any of these maladies. Now, I'm not going to go through number three, so that'll, that'll uh, probably give you some relief there. If you had any interest in kind of pursuing this a little bit, the names that I've list, uh, listed there, all the way from, you know, there's folks like Matei on there and Bright Haupt and all the way up to Abby Whiteside and Dorothy Talbot and Barbara Lister Singh. This is kind of a roll call of piano teachers during the last, I don't know, 150 years or so that have really researched and done a lot of thinking into what makes good piano playing good piano playing. And, you know, they're... Their different theories are always, you know, sometimes they conflict with one another, uh, but it's, you know, if you have no life, as I have no life, it's kind of an interesting thing to do to uh, go back in and study what these people, uh, what they taught and what their methodologies were. The two folks that backed me out of my injury uh, were the last two names on the list, not Dorothy Talbot personally, I never had a chance to work with her but folks who were trained in the Taubman technique. Uh, and then Barbara Listersink, who is very much alive and well and living in Winston-Salem, a wonderful uh, teacher. And when I moved to Boulder, Colorado, to do my graduate degree, uh, there was a lady there who was a, a Taubman, uh, who had been trained at the Taubman School, when she was able to just right away start identifying some things in her playing that helped me very gradually back out of the injury that I'd had all through my, you know, most of my 20s. And, um, and so I was very, very grateful to find her, and, um, and I even to this day still continue uh, working with some Talbot folks every now and then, and I've, I've worked with Barbara Listersink, who also is wonderful. I have resources that I've listed in the very back if you ever wanted to get in touch with uh, Barbara Listersink or anyone from the uh, uh, Talbot School. Dorothy Taubman has passed away now, and the lady that carries on her tradition of teaching is a wonderful lady named Edna Galansky, and, and she has something called the Galansky Institute, which uh, every year I think they rotate places throughout the country, but they put on festivals and conferences where folks come in there and study, and then there's people that Edna Galansky has trained that um, are able to teach this methodology based in Taubman's approach, and, and they live you know, all over, all over the place. The lady that I work with actually lives in Boulder, Colorado, but she flies down to, uh, to Houston and, and that area, and I'll sometimes go down there, and, and I've just started actually going down there and working with her. Um, so, I'm going to go through uh, a list here of, of some things to watch out for. I, I'm not going to give you Talman methodology. I, I'm not going to give you Barbara Listersink methodology. I'm smart enough not to do that, because people that really teach that stuff, go through years of training to really know how to do it. And and I've not done that. I was retrained in there and it backs me out of my injury, but if I tried to teach that to someone, it would be a disaster. <laughs> and, and to be totally honest, I, I have to also say that there are a lot of folks out there that maybe have a lesson or two with 
uh, Edna Galansky and a lesson or two with Barbara Listersink, and then they think, ah, I'm trained and certified and, you know, I can teach this. And, and they really do more harm than good because they don't really understand the concepts and they misrepresent the concepts. And so there's a lot of uh, vicious lies, rumors, and ignorance that, you know, go around, you know, with the, the ways that these different schools retrain because people kind of hang out a shingle and say, I, I'm going to teach this, and they really don't, they're not really certified to do it. In fact, both of those schools have lengthy certification processes, processes that, that people go through. So I'm not going to uh, go through those techniques. I want to extract some common sense things that can kind of help keep you um, out of the way of danger, and I, I think that'll be good here as we go through the next 30 minutes or so. So, um, have you ever thought about how an injury occurs? Yeah, we know when we have one, right, because our, our hands hurt, but we don't often think about how, how they occur. Nine out of ten times, the injuries that happen at piano playing are related to our tendons. Okay, and again, I don't want to be boring, but I'm going to read a quote written uh, by a guy named Thomas Mark in a really great book that I recommend called What Every Pianist Needs to Know About the Body. And Thomas Mark says this, tendons become injured because of repeated tensing or from rubbing on nearby ligaments and bones. Subjected to constant stress, tendons may fray or tear apart or become thickened and bumpy. The injured area may calcify. The tendon sheath is also vulnerable. It may produce excess fluid, causing swelling. The tendon may become locked in the sheath and sheath and move jerkily. The sheath may become inflamed and press in on the tendon. Inflammation and swelling in the restricted place, a space of the carpal tunnel can put pressure on the median nerve, leading to tingling and numbness of the thumb and second finger which often indicate carpal tunnel syndrome. I mean, all this starts to sound kind of like some kind of medieval torture chamber, you know, if you're a pianist. But when these tendons become inflamed, that's where we, that's where we start to, you know, get into trouble. And so the answer or the question is, how do we play in a way that is the most, you know, likely to preserve those tendons? So we all know what carpal tunnel syndrome is. We've all heard about it. Um, has anyone ever had it or dealt with it? I know we had one lady that said that she kind of dealt with some playing related issues, but has anyone had it and undergone the surgery to kind of, good for you guys. I, I, fortunately, I never never had it. I really want to set my piano there, but I'm, or my water on the piano, but I'm sure Baylor would appreciate me not to do that. Um, so I've already explained a little bit about what tendonitis is. What, what carpal tunnel is, which is really probably the leading you know, cause of issues with pianists, is that we have something that goes down the length of our arm called the median nerve. Have you ever heard of the median nerve? And it, it goes through a space in the center of our wrist, uh, it travels through that space, and that's the carpal tunnel. And the carpal tunnel's not that big, it's really only about the size of the tip of your, your thumb, okay, so it's not, not very big. Well, what do you think goes inside the carpal tunnel? Okay, how many, it's tendons, right? How many tendons would you guess fit inside this already very, very tight space? A bunch. A bunch. Would you guess five for the five four fingers and the thumb that we have? There's actually nine that go through. Each one of your four fingers has two tendons connected to it, so that's eight. And then the thumb has one. Okay, so within the, the space of the carpal tunnel, you've got nine tendons that are boxed on top of one another going through there, okay? Well, it's easy to see that if one of those tendons become a little bit inflamed and it starts swelling, okay, that is already going to start to really make the space inside the carpal tunnel uh, kind of tight. And what's going through that carpal tunnel in addition to the nine tendons is the median nerve. Right, you remember the median nerve we talked about. And so once the space gets really tight in there, it starts compressing on that median nerve. And that's where you get all the tingling and the numbness, you know, and everything that we, we hear about carpal tunnel. One interesting thing about carpal tunnel is that it really, the median nerve is only connected to your thumb, and I can't remember if it's the first two fingers or the three fingers. I want to say it's just two. And so uh, 
if you have numbness and tingling in your hand and it's affecting your pinky, it's probably not carpal tunnel because the median nerve is not connected to the pinky, right? It, it affects this side of the hand. Uh, so that is a little bit about carpal tunnel and, and how it comes about. And already just knowing a little bit of that can start to help us understand ways that we can protect the space inside our wrist and our, our muscles and our finger. And that's where I want to move into here. So turn the page and look at the top of the next page on how to avoid injury. And this is where we get into the, um, into the nuts and bolts here of what, what we want to talk about. And again, I'm very, uh, I want to throw this out that although I've worked with both Taubman and Listersick, I, I, what I'm giving you guys is just common sense stuff. This isn't, um, I'm very careful about making sure I say over and over that I don't represent them in any official way because I don't at all. Um, knowing that the carpal tunnel passes through the wrist, we want to give that wrist as much, that carpal tunnel space, as much breathing room as we possibly can. Okay? So that gives us a clue as how we how we need to hold our wrist. Okay, we don't want to put our wrist for any length of time in any position that might cramp that space because it's already tight enough. Well, that means that if this is the keyboard, I don't want to be doing that, right? Because, I mean, it's just like a water hose. You know, I mean, if I bend the water hose, water's not coming through there, right? Likewise, that's also not great, right, to spend any, you know, extended amount of time there. When it comes to piano technique, we find really, and this is common sense stuff, but we find that the mid-range of motion is where we really want to live the most. Because when I'm in that mid-range of motion right there, this gives the wrist a little bit more uh, breathing room, so to speak, if that makes, makes sense. Now, that's so much easier said than done. And, and we've all seen pianists that, you know, play with a, a habitually low wrist. You know, I mean, we see that all the time. Uh, you know, we less likely see pianists that play with a really high wrist, but I, I see a lot of this low wrist. And, and a lot of times I'll see people that play loud chords and they're... You, you folks there, let me see if I can just angle this up. You can at least kind of see a little bit more. Uh, if you if you want to move over to where you can see it, I, I won't demonstrate a ton at the piano, but if you want to, feel free to do that. It's going to be Ninety, so he's still alive. My father was alive. That is incredible. So, uh, what I was doing was, was playing loud chords with a really low wrist, and and when I see that, I, I it just makes me cringe. I just want to go and say, stop. You don't you don't know what you're what you're what you're really doing here. Along, uh, one of the best ways that we can kind of train ourselves to have a, a mid-range of motion bench height is actually one of the things we seldom think about. And that is, what is the optimum height of the bench? And this is where we kind of really start getting into some tried and true techniques that you could take home with you. Anyone know, how do you judge bench height? Watch. How it feels to me. I mean, okay. I've been playing since I was five, and I'm 82. Okay. And I've never had a problem. Never before. had a problem. Well, but I, I don't want to change anything. I have the bench way up here. Okay. Because I don't have the strength to play uh -huh. unless I'm sitting way above the keyboard. Okay. Okay. So that's just me. That's my. Absolutely. Body. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. That's right. What else? Anyone? That's, that's pretty good. That's close to what I'm going to say when I, I kind of give you the, the thought. Edna Galansky teaches, and I, I really think this is pretty, pretty slick. She teaches that the height of the bench needs to be at a place where the tip of your elbow is more or less equal to, or maybe even slightly higher than, the white keys. Mm -hmm. Okay? And, and if, you, if you test that, you're going to find that most of us sit too low, believe it or not. Uh, most of us sit too low. Now, um, 
uh, come on up and let me, I'll, I'll use you as a, as a little example here for a second, and I'll, I'll show you a, a, a neat way that we can test it. Does anyone have a hard hat folder? Um, any, any kind of, uh, oh, I, I think I have one. I do. And this is what we've been doing, doing music in, something that really won't bend that much. Now, obviously, there, you know, we have an artist bench here, so we can scoot it up or down if we can. But what I want you to do is to put your hand on the keys like you're going to play. And, um, and I'm going to put this book underneath you. And I, I don't want you to manipulate, manipulate your arms or, or anything like that. Okay? Just don't try to raise up. Just, you're not too bad. Okay? You, it, it actually still, even here with you, could be a little bit higher. I, I want you to do the same thing for me real quick. Okay. And you can do this with yourself, but it, it sometimes is helpful just to have other folks. Let me get my hands here in playing position and then put that underneath. This is incredibly low for me. This bench height is incredibly low. Okay, And I, I can sense this, and I, I don't know if this thing uh, can go up any higher. Most of the time, benches really are never going to get you as high as you need to go. Okay, And you know, as, as P, thank you, that's all I need. As pianists, we tend to just kind of take what comes, you know, at the church we play at, or right, that's the bench they have, so that's what I'm going to use. Um, when, I, when I taught piano, here's one of the best ways of, of elevating the bench height. Fortunately, we really hardly ever need to lower the bench beyond what it can go, because most people sit, as I said, too, uh, too low. If for whatever reason you really do find that you need to lower the bench a little bit, just saw the legs off. I'm kidding. That was a joke. Don't, don't, don't do that. That was a joke. But uh, you know, no one wants to put pillows under on the on the uh, seat or books. You know, those things cause a whole world of trouble. And, and so, well, you, but you know, they 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 cause unless you have it evenly laid out, you're going to be safe. Yeah, it's just, so here's what um, is the best solution in the world: carpet squares. You know, if you go to a carpet store, like you, they'll give you squares that almost perfectly cover the entire bench, and you just take samples. You know, get six or seven samples, uh, either free or pay a small amount for it, and the six or seven samples will raise you that high. So I don't really teach private piano much anymore, but when I did, all my students would come into my studio, and they would all know how many carpet squares they needed. You know, and I'd have them over in a corner, and they'd go and grab the two carpet squares or three carpet squares, and and then sit down on that. I don't do that as often as I should uh, because I really don't get to practice a whole lot anymore. I sit in front of a computer uh, and that's kind of where the music making happens for me. But um, even at home when I do practice I, I am not as dogmatic as I used to be about that and, and when I really play a lot and I'm sitting too low uh, it really uh, kind of starts to bite me back a little bit. Um, so Carpet squares is the best thing. If you if you end up sitting too low, then you can imagine what what's going to happen. You're going to come to the piano like this, right? If you're sitting too low, right? Of course. And likewise, if you're sitting too high, it's common sense. You're putting that pin there. So so we want to find that that place where you know this is in the mid range of motion, and bench height is. It's one of the most ridiculously important things in piano technique, and most of us just kind of, huh, whatever the bench is, I'll play with it. It's fine. And so, rather you've had injuries or not, um, you want to be thinking about the bench. And, and you know, if you play at church, you have a church job, just take the carpet squares there at church and place them on the bench. You know, no one's going to see them. Uh, most churches, you're behind a plant or a fern anyway, you know, when you play... <laughs> You know, Joe Martin is always yes. talking about writing his autobiography, and he's going to call it "Behind the Fern," <laughs> um, because that's where where we you know where we, we end up. Um, so wrist and, and forearm relationship. So we we've talked about the wrist from this point of view, okay? But now then we want to talk about it from this point of view, okay? When we uh, when we do this, okay? This is this is called radial and Ernal, er, er, ulnar, ulnar, U L N A R, ulnar, deviation. Okay. Well, the folks over at the Taubman School just call it twisting, right? Because that's that's really what it is. the The concept is is that you want to avoid as much as possible being in a twist. Okay. Because and, and it makes sense. I mean, if you think about this, you know, nerve that we have running down through here in the tight space. 
If I do that, and particularly if I do it in a tense manner or if I uh, do it in an extended period of time, and then I start moving these guys, um, that's kind of cramping up the space in there, and that's going to cause those tendons to really rub against one another and, and, and not going to be so great. Um, so, it's difficult to avoid twisting, and, and there's some really some choreography things that you, you can start doing at the piano to kind of help. Um, and most of them are common sense stuff, but you know, if I sit at the piano, you know, where does most of the material that I'm going to play happen? Well, it's going to happen right in here. Well, even right here is a small little twist. I mean, if I put my hands in the middle of the piano to play chopsticks, uh, my hands look like that, right? Well, that's not going to hurt anyone. Of course not. But if you play for hours and hours on end, day in and day out, then a little bitty twist like this all of a sudden can start to cause some issues, right? Because pianists, you know, we don't, we deal with small microscopic, not microscopic, but very tiny muscles that we're just using relentlessly. How many thousands of times do we energize or engage our muscles in playing just one page of music, you know? Uh, so, for instance, if I have to play extended passage work here in the middle of the piano, I find myself now more often than not scooting back, or not scooting back, but leaning back a little bit. And what that does, you can see it right away. If I move forward, it twists. If I lean back just a little bit, it relieves that twist a little bit. It's the difference from there to there. Mm -hmm. But that's a huge difference when you talk about something that you do for hours on end every day. You know, someone that's kind of a weekend warrior that just comes in on Sunday and plays, you know, just as I am, and then that's it till next Sunday, they don't have a lot to worry about. But those of us that really spend a lot of time at the piano, um, you know, we do. I, I, it's always difficult to play these passages that are really up here, right, because of what it does with your, your, your left hand. And so the answer there is to lean over a little bit, and then not only lean over, but lean back some. And then you can play with both hands in more or less an untwisted position. The exact opposite would be down here, you know, if you're playing Bartok or something, you know, and you get that real aggressive left hand, right? I, I am never afraid anymore to lean over here and just do that. And in years past, I was always taught that your behind is stationed here and you're always right here and this is what you do. You know, you don't, you maintain that balance and you, you don't give yourself the freedom to really enjoy the entire, um, Choreography, you know, that you you might have available to you. Does that make sense? You guys, yeah. you guys get what I'm saying there. And so I, I find myself in when I was coming out of my injury that I would almost kind of like a dancer. Almost I would choreograph myself being at certain positions in the keyboard at different parts of the piece, just to where I would be there to uh, kind of make sure that my hands really, and particularly this hand, was avoiding you know being in in a stretch position. And I know, um, you know, that, that there's times where, of course, we, we, we don't, you know, you can't stay like that all the time. You, ju you just can't. Uh, but this is your home base that you try to find and come back to and remain in as often as possible. Of course, you, you know, there's always going to be little deviations in there, but it's the extended times that we just play entire pieces and, you know, we're, do that, right? I mean, if you're really away from the keyboard, if you just do that and, and see what that feels like, it's not a great feeling, right? Um, so that's a little bit about the relationship there between the wrist and the forearm. Finger position. Uh, again, this, this deal with finger position is that we, um, you know what, there's one other thing I'm going to say about, about twisting and uh, and I'll, I'll, let me do that right now, and then we'll talk about uh, finger position. Thomas Mark talks a lot, let, let me backtrack for a minute. Before we do finger position, I have one other thing I want to say about this wrist form. One of the ways that we can move into uh, a, str a, a twist on the piano and kind of do it and get away with it is if we don't go into the position in what Thomas Mark, who wrote this great book, What Every Pianist Needs to Know About the Body, calls a thumb-oriented position, okay? Now, here's what I mean by that. If I, if I had um, a water bottle, here, hold this water bottle there, Lila, and I'm going to reach out for it. If you were offering it to me and I reached out for it, most of us are going to reach and watch carefully what I'm doing. I'm reaching like that. Okay, now, what did I do? Let me do it again in slow motion, okay? I'm reaching like that. 
okay, to grab it. My thumb is leading the way, and I'm going to grab that water bottle, okay? Try it. Grab an imaginary water bottle, and very few of us are going to grab it like that. Most of us are kind of letting the thumb jut out a little bit and, and grab it, okay? Uh, and it's an uncomfortable feeling, right? It's, it's, you know, it's just thumb, it's thumb orientation. It's like the thumb is our, you know, the head of the snake and the rest of the hand is following, okay? And we sometimes approach the piano that way. I find myself doing it even now that I'm, even in the simple act of bringing my hand to the piano, I do it like that. And already there's tension there, okay? And if we can kind of learn to move the hand to the piano as a single unit, just the very process of moving the piano, moving the hand to the piano, and not letting the thumb be what guides us to the piano, uh, can kind of open up easier playing. And you know what, an example that I've heard many people give of this, if, if you had me hanging from a bar, you know, what do you call it, chin up, you know, if I was hanging from a chin up bar, I'm not hanging like that, right? I would be hanging like this. Right, So thumb orientation really doesn't make a lot of sense, but yet so much of our piano playing and the way we approach the piano and move our hands on the piano, the thumb is really guiding instead of the hand just being like a big old bear paw that, you know, is just kind of... Does that make sense? Yeah, so I wanted to, wanted to throw that out. Uh, I, I get the privilege of being in his office every day when he's not traveling, and I get to watch Joe play the piano a lot. And I believe Joe Martin must probably be the most natural pianist uh, that I've, I've ever met. You know, he, he, all these concepts that I talk about, how he moves and all that, uh, he, he does them effortlessly and perfectly, and I'm sure he's never been taught them. He just kind of has some kind of, or maybe he has. But I, I suspect it's a combination of good teaching and just kind of innate natural coordination that, that he has. And when I watch him, I just sit there and watch his fingers and watch him play, and it's just, you know, I mean, how could he not play the way he does, as effortlessly as he approaches the piano? And, uh, and that's actually been very uh, insightful for me, just to sometimes peek over his shoulder, just watch his hands, you know. And that's, that's also a, probably a misleading thing, because there's a lot of people, believe it or not, that play with what looks like very beautiful, eloquent motion, but they're as tense as they can be. You know, I move, I can move my hand, you know, like I'm floating through water right now, and this looks good, but I'm, you might not know it, but I'm tensing up all my muscles here. Yeah, you know, so uh, sometimes looks can be deceiving, and people that look very loose might not necessarily be all that loose. Let's talk about finger position. So, um, we see folks that play overly curled. We see folks that sometimes play a little bit flat-fingered. I think we see curling more than flat-fingered. A lot of people teach curling, uh, and they don't mean to, but a lot of early teachers, you know, I, I, I've seen books that say, imagine you're holding the baseball, you know, like you're going to throw it, and that's, you know, that's your position. I saw one book which I like a little bit more, which is place your hand on top of your head and whatever that natural... Well, whatever that thing is, that's your position. Well, hold that natural baseball for a minute. Hold the baseball, and that's your playing position. Put a little bitty curl there in your hands. Well, now try to move those fingers fast. You know, now really curl it and try to move your fingers. It feels icky, right? Now, likewise, you know, stretch them out like you're trying to really put some distance between your uh, fifth finger and your paw and your pinky and try to move it. That doesn't work so well either. It's just right there in the middle. That's where things free up. Okay, And I know that's a common sense thing, but if you really catch yourself and look, most of us play out of that mid-range of motion. And the best way to find it is just put your hand down at your side, you know, and like you're walking around the beautiful campus here. And if you look at how my hand is, there's, I guess, a little curl in there, but it's a natural curl. If I start curling that at all, it, you know, there we go. But where that is is the natural shape for my hand. So if I can somehow bring that to the piano, then that's, that's how my hand plays, okay? And I don't need to adjust it either out or in any different from that, okay? Once you start kind of tuning in to a, a more natural hand shape, which for most people is a little more uncurled. I won't say, I, you know, without seeing folks play, I'm hesitant to give you a, a rule on it, but I think people tend to play a little more curled as a rule more often than they play a little more flat-fingered, as a rule, okay? 
Um, what about uh, another thing that folks that really study, you know, ergonomic ways of playing the piano, another thing that they talk about that we really want to be careful of is what we call stretching. Uh, well, obviously that's a real scientific word there. But how many of us, I do this all the time, I, I come to the piano and I know that I've got to play a big chord and before I even touch the keys on the chord, my hand is already in that position. I've preformed my hand into that big chord that I need to play. Well, stretch your hand, right? Stretch your hand. I, I mean, that doesn't feel great, right? And then you try to, try to move your fingers. Edna Galansky, um, who is, again, probably the, at this point in time, the uh, foremost uh, 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 representative of the Taubman School of Teaching, I went to a conference once, and she did the most interesting thing. I'll never forget it. She had us stretch our hands apart like that, and, and then feel the band of tension that, that comes across your hand. And then, you, you really, some of us have more difficulty doing this than others, but she then asked us to hold our hand up in the natural position, don't do a thing. Let me demonstrate it once for you, and then I'll ask you to do it. And then she said, this hand does nothing. This hand does nothing. It doesn't open up, it doesn't move, it just is there. It does nothing. This hand does all the work. And what this hand is now going to do, and again, this hand does nothing, it's just along for the ride. I'm going to take this pinky, and I'm going to take this thumb, and I'm going to open my hand up with my other hand. Well, at this point right now, I'm stretched just as far as I was when I was consciously trying to stretch this hand, but there is no tension there. Okay? Now try that. Go back to stretching it, okay? And then let this hand just be lifeless, and let your other hand come and do the opening up. And then you should, if you're doing it right, you're going to stretch yourself just as far, but there's no tension there, right? Okay, it's pretty, if you're still feeling tension there, this hand's still trying to do the work. When it really stops doing the work, and you let the other hand open it up, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's easier to do it when you, when you have someone else coming up and doing it, right? You don't feel it there, do you? Right, okay. Um... And so that was kind of groundbreaking for me because the idea is when we open our hand, it stretches, but if an outside agency or force comes and opens up our hand for us, um, then there's no tension. So, of course, where this is going, you can guess, we let the piano open our hand for us. Well, how does the piano open your hand? Well, I, I'm hesitant to really go too far into this because, I, again, I'm not really a representative of... of, of the Taubman approach. But from the best I can figure, uh, to me, honestly, it's almost kind of a mind trick. You know, that if I, if I know I've got to play an octave, and I stretch my hand out and preform it, then there it is. Right? And my hand is so tense, I mean, you could, you know, I could hold off a, a car with my hand, it's so tense. But if I think about the piano opening my hand, and I just kind of allow my hand to plop onto the key, well, of course, I'm still opening up my hands. Of course I am. But something about that mindset, uh, if you were to come and fill the underside of my hand, there's no tension there. That band of tension is just not there. It kind of is allowing me to open my hand using just the amount of tension that I need to open it, and no more. You know, one of the most vicious, I think, in my study of piano pedagogy, one of the most vicious lies that I've ever been told and that I've heard a gazillion teachers tell students, and even I've told students uh, throughout the years, is relax, relax, relax. <laughs> well, I mean, if we honest to goodness relaxed, we'd fall on the floor. <laughs> and, and even then, we are not really relaxed because our heart's beating, right? And every time it pumps, that's a muscle that's, that's tensing up and then relaxing. So, what happened with me when my teachers would tell me to relax is I'd try to relax so much, everything would just kind of turn into dead weight. And then when I have to move again, it takes more energy to move something that's dead weight than something that's already in motion. So then I'd really get tense because I'd have to move that arm over there that I tried so hard to relax. Um, and and I, I think a better way of thinking of it is you have to use tension, but you only use the amount of tension you need and no more. Right, and, and what we think of as being extra tense at the piano, or any instrument, 
is when we're using more tension than what we need to accomplish the task. If I want to pick up my phone there, I simply pick it up, right? I don't sit and go, you start shaking, I'm getting so much tension there, and then I'm going to, you know, that, that's tense, right? I'm, I'm doing way more work for something that I just do, right? And so, oddly enough, we know how to judge that correct amount of tension as we go through our lives, but when we come to the piano, we end up using more tension than what we really need to accomplish the task. Does that make sense? You guys get that? And, and so something about, you know, and I, I, again, early exercises, which I'm, you can go home and experiment with, was uh, I remember my teacher would have me just play six. I wouldn't start with an octave. That was a little too hard. She had me start with playing six and just concentrate on not preforming that sixth in my hand. And after I play the sixth, you can see my hand closes back up. Right, and then I play the next one, and it closes back up. And it, it created such a wonderful, uh, you know, sense of freedom. I started with that sixth, and then I would move out to, um, you know, other other repertoire, I'm, or other intervals. I know that there's questions in your mind right now. Yeah, what about those passages in list that have just nonstop octaves that are really fast? You know, you don't have time to let your hand close up in between. And you're right, you don't. There's a, there's a trick around that, uh, which I'm not, I won't go into in the amount of time that we have because there's other things that, that we want to talk about. But the very fact of starting to experiment with, with this idea of letting the piano be the outside agency that kind of does the work of opening your hand for you, it's a really different sensation. And it can kind of transform the way you, you approach the piano in some ways. Um, Co-contractions. Dual muscular.